Everyone, welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. If you're a student supervisor or university instructor, this is the episode for you in session 259. I speak with Donna Meller and Dr. Steve Eversole of Pass the Big ABA Exam and Behavior Development Solutions, respectively. In this conversation, they reflect on what they've learned about helping thousands of people pass the BCBA exam over many years. In this conversation, we covered why they got into the test prep business in the first place. We talk about the state of BCBA testing today. Uh, We talk about retaking the exam, uh, interpreting the board's retake data, barriers to passing the exam, including things like test anxiety and specific topics of difficulty, their counterintuitive positions on SAF meds and mock exams, the role of social media, and how both of them became friends despite being competitors. This is a really interesting episode, and I think there are lots of just really nuggets of wisdom that, again, you will find very, very helpful. You can find complete show notes to this episode and links to their respective websites and all the other things that they talk about over at behavioralobservations.com. And while you're over there, do me a favor, sign up, or do yourself a favor, I guess, sign up for the mailing list. And what that will allow to happen is for these show notes to get emailed and sent directly to your inbox so you don't have to go to behavioralobservations.com. So it's really easy to do. When you go to behavioralobservations.com, there'll be a pop-up that, well, pops up. You can put your name and email address in there. The mailing list is 100% non-spammy, and it's very convenient. You just get, again, the show notes delivered right to your email inbox. Before we get to this episode, I want to let you know that we are brought to you by ACE-approved CEUs from, well, Behavioral Observations. That's right. You can get CEUs while listening to your favorite podcast episodes, and you can do so while you're driving, walking your dog, folding the laundry, doing the dishes, or whatever else you might have going on. So go to behavioralobservations.com and click the Get CEUs tab, and you can see what we have available there. We're also brought to you by the University of Cincinnati Online. Uh, They designed a Master's of Education and Behavior Analysis program that is 100% online and asynchronous, meaning you log on when it works for you. If you want to learn more, go to online.uc.edu and click the Request Info button. And we're also brought to you by the Behavioral Toolbox. You may have seen me post about this on social media. It's the new collaboration that I've been involved with with Dr. Polly Gavoni and Anika Costa. And we're about to release our second course. Our first course is called Ready, Set, Consult. Second course is called When Not to FBA. And there's a long subtitle that I'm blanking on right now, but it is uh, it is taught by yours truly, but it is a team effort. And I think it's something that, well, both courses, I think, are things that if you work in schools as a BCBA, that you will find helpful. If you want to learn more about that, go to thebehavioraltoolbox.com and click on the Courses button. And we're going to have a new sponsor in the near future, the New England Center for Children. So be on the lookout for some content about what they have going on. I'm very, very excited about this new partnership. So stay tuned for that. But that's it for opening remarks. So without any further delay, let's dig into prepping for the BCBA exam with Steve and Donna. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. All right, I'm here with Donna Miller and Steve Eversole, uh, and uh, they are from uh, past the Big ABA exam and BDS, respectively. Welcome, guys. Thanks for joining me today. So this is going to be a really fun episode, and we're going to talk a lot about passing the exam, of course. And I want to start by, I guess, just with a little bit of twist on my usual introductory question. You know, as I mentioned in our chats leading up to the podcast, whenever I had multiple people, I tried not to do the, you know, how'd you get into the ABA question just because it cuts into a lot of the time. So I want to, I want to change the question just ever so slightly and ask you guys how you got into, you know, this test prep gig that you've, uh, I say gig uh, jokingly, you know, you guys have been doing this quite professionally for some period of time. So what made you want to get into this line of work of helping people pass exams like the BCBA exam and 
the BCABA exam and things along those lines. So Donna, why don't you, uh, why don't you I, I've got a bit of background with BDS for a variety of reasons, which perhaps we'll explore later on. So l- let's go with you first. I, I'm curious to hear about your background. Sure. You know, I think it's it's so hard to really nail down the exact moment that this seemed like a direction to go in. There was a lot of contingencies at play that made it last. But I think, honestly, it was a conversation with my partner at the time that we, you know, conceptualized this idea just about having some friends who were struggling with passing the exam. And and we had both actually done the BDS modules and successfully and, and really enjoyed it. And we're thinking about just, you know, some of the things that we did in addition, which was a more interactive, you know, engaging with each other, having study groups, things like that. So we just thought, what if we came up with something that was a little bit more interactive, like some study groups? I don't think we anticipated that we were starting a new company at that initial phase. I think we just thought it would be fun to get some of the people we knew that were struggling. And it kind of grew like wildfire in our Southern California area. People had heard about the fact that we were doing these study groups. And that all sort of in small steps led to the creation of the study manual and then to a sort of more formalized process for the workshop. But originally just an idea to to help friends you know, obviously with a secret hope that it could be something supplemental that we do on the side. We both enjoyed teaching. We both enjoyed being around other people. And full disclosure, we were both looking for something else to try with our BCBAs. Just we're trying to feel like, you know, trying to be creative about some other way to utilize all that education and, you know, maybe a little burnout at the, you know, at the helm of all of that, but kind of just combining all of those things. And then, turning it into something bigger just as a product of a lot of reinforcement. So just a lot of success for a lot of our students. And also just for us, we just really enjoyed it. And we we saw an opportunity to turn it into something more full-time. Very cool. So about what time did you, how long have you been doing this, I guess? When did you start yeah, down well, this path? Shockingly, we're going to be heading into our 12th year. So 12 years ago, I and I still can't, even believe that because it feels like yesterday that I reached out to Steve and said, hi, (laughs) what's new? (laughs) But yeah, I mean, it's, it's really crazy. I I still very much feel like a newbie in very, very many ways. And then there's days where I feel like I've been at this forever. So yeah, 12 years. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Legit, huh? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's that's very very cool. So, Steve, I, I I know about how long BDS has been around because I I just recently renewed my certification, and so this is the I think the twenty first year I've been certified, which makes me feel ancient in many ways. And I told the story on the podcast before, and I've certainly told you when we've met at conferences that it was the you know my clinical director. Dr. Jim McJimsey came into my office and I uh, shared an office with a colleague of mine, Dr. Cheryl Ecott, and he took a couple of CDs. He's like, hey, guys, I heard you taking the test. And he threw these CDs on our, our desks. Uh, <laughs> and thank goodness he did, because there's a lot of stuff we did not get in our, in our you know, I love my time at Auburn, but it was a very much an experimental analysis of behavior program. But we, you know, we, we went deep on things like Honig and Staden and all sorts of uh, really interesting things, but we, you know, we did not get a lot of background in verbal behavior and, you know, all sorts of, you know, other sorts of things. And so I I could say, and I, I can confirm this other people in our, in our cohort, if you will, that the, you know, test prep curricula like BDS really helped round out what we didn't get in, in, in coursework. Of course, you know, that again is many decades, you know, a couple of decades ago, but anyway, so I'm curious what, what, what drove you to start that? Because uh, it was pretty. It seemed like it was kind of like way ahead of its time. So, so tell me a little bit about your thought process. What were the conditions under which you said, "Hey, you know, I want to put this this uh, test prep software together"? Well, I, I, a few things came together that, and and timing was everything. I got really really lucky with the timing. But as I was finishing up my doctoral degree, my one of my professors said, "You know, you you really ought to focus on." A specialty area and and get you know develop some expertise in 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 one area and i think that's a good good advice for anybody any new behavior analyst out there get a get, get some expertise in in a particular area and and really shine in that area 
But anyway, and I, I looked around and I thought, well, what's what's kind of new? Because it seemed like every all the areas of expertise were already full of people. And, and one area that was kind of new on the horizon was computer-based training. Because this was like the early to mid nineties. So so I thought, okay, I'll I'll do that. And I was doing some parent training at the time. So I thought, well, maybe I'll develop some like computer-based modules that teach people to parent. And I started to work on that. And then a little while later I switched jobs and I was working with with Pat McGreevy and several other behavior analysts in, in wow. Tennessee. And 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 Pat suggested, well, why don't you develop something for the CBAs in Florida to help people pass the CBA exam, which was the the Florida certification exam, which, you know, this was like 96, 97. The board was, wasn't even in existence. So I thought, that's a great idea. So I started on that. And shortly after I started that, I heard this story about Jer- Jerry Shook starting up a board. and Sure enough, I was working on the very thing that they were starting to develop the the whole program around, the whole BACB around. So, so when the the first test came out, I was I was there. I had the had the product. Well, actually, I didn't have the whole product. I had part of the product. But anyway, that that was that was it. But but so I, I owe a debt of gratitude to Pat McGreevy. And then Guy Bruce gave me the the instructional design model in a workshop that I took from him. So it's you know I, I was I was gathering this information from other behavior analysts who, you know who who did some education and and so on and and just leveraged that to develop the modules. And so we were we were selling them in 1998. That was the first first year we sold them. Did you teach yourself to, did you code them yourself and turn, you know, or program them yourself? Or is that something that you, you had to, is that a skill that you had to take on? Or did you okay. find people to help you with that? I'm just curious about the, the, the what, what probably at the time was a, a, a very challenging task of, you know, for those who don't know, it's a computer based interactive, I guess, a portal or platform or what have you. And it's dynamic and all of these things happen. It's, you know, it's a lot of if then. You know, you know, kind of statements that are that are going on in the background. So, what was the? What, how did you prepare to deliver that to the to the marketplace, as it were? Yeah. Well, of course, back in those days, it wasn't online. It it was computer based. That's why you were given CDs and mm-hmm. login credentials. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it was. I, I'll include a Wikipedia reference to it. To that. <laughs> but go ahead. In the show notes. Anyway, go ahead. So, so it was. Uh, there was a program, software program that I bought for like six or seven hundred dollars. It was called. It was the, the generic name was authoring software, and so it had. And it was for designing computer based, again not online, but computer based training of of exams and and things. And so, so I did actually. You know, with this software that did a lot of the, the heavy coding for you, I did some of the light coding in the very first version of it. And then soon after that, you know, after I realized that, you know, this, this might, might have some legs, I, for subsequent versions, I hired, hired real programmers because I figured I can't be a programmer and a behavior analyst. And I'm certainly not a very good programmer. So. So I, I and and now I, we got you know a team of programmers and and when, when we first went online you know the 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 thought was well I'll hire this programmer to develop it and then it'll be done but that didn't happen you know you you need that talent continuously to to maintain and and improve as you go along. I see. I see. I want to talk about more of that and i want to explore kind of the different philosophies or different styles of instruction that both both of you guys have available but before we do that i think it might be helpful to step back and talk about the testing in general and and i don't know i don't want to put you guys on the spot or i won't hold you guys to this is probably more questions that the the people at the board can answer but 
I, I, I suppose you might have more insight than the average PCA, PCBA about what the, the state of testing right now in 2023 is, you know, so what, what do you guys know about, you know, how many people are taking the test? What percent are, you know, pass or and fail things along those lines? Do we have a sense of like how many people are passing or are, are passing their first time, second time, et cetera? What do we know about testing in general as of, I guess, as of today's recording? I think we all have access to that same information. Certainly, I don't know about Steve, but the board certainly doesn't give me any special insights. All I can say is in the 12 years that I have been at it, obviously, the amount of people entering the profession has increased substantially. And I'm sure it's exponential from when Steve started back when they had to walk through the snow to take the VCBA exam. But honestly, the margins to me seem stable. I mean, there's a little variability, but for the first timers, you know, it's I've seen it fluctuate from the high 50s to the mid 60 percentile in in my time. And obviously the retaker rates from, you know, in the mid 20s to early 30 percent pass rate margins. So and I don't think there's been that much variability there. There's some years are a little higher or a little lower than others, as far as I can see. One of the things that's different now is since we've had continuous testing, since we don't have like, you know, results day, you don't get to have the emotional sense because there used to be this moment on results day where Facebook and Instagram and social media and even our email would blow up with I passed or I failed. And you can just sort of emotionally feel like it seems like a lot of people passed this year or wow, we're getting a lot of I failed, you know, alerts. But now, you know, it's you know, every couple of days you get something versus just like one big explosive, you know, announcement. That's how I see it. <laughs> yeah. I I did I did happen to look at these these data a couple of days ago and the the latest data that the board has posted indicates a pass rate of 60% for first time exam takers. And that's down just a little bit from from previous years. But think about it, Donna, this was 1921 or 2021 what happened in 2021 everybody was taking the test so you had people taking the test that weren't really ready for it yep. and and in and the reason why there was this big bump in 2021 is because in 2022 they had a new test and people wanted to get in under the new test because some of them would have had to retake coursework and so on so, so as a result, you know, like I say, you had people that weren't quite prepared that were taking the test then and people that were, had, had just been procrastinating, I guess. Right. Yeah. And then the other thing that I want to say about that, you, you pointed out the, the low pass rate for the retakers. And one thing I always like to stress about this is that is retakers, not second time test takers. Right. Right. Because we don't know if it's twice or 10 times. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so the probability of passing on your second time, this, you know, if you fail it once and then you take it a second time, it's not going to be as low as what that retakers retake score is. If your second time, you know, should, you know, it's going to be a lower, but it, lower than the first time test takers, but it's not going to be, you know, like in that 30% range or whatever it is. So people who fail once shouldn't get too discouraged by looking at those retake, retake scores because all those re all those retakers is people have taken it once or twice or three times or not once, but you know, two or three times. And also as many as like you said, 10 times. So the problem, you figure if you failed it three or four times, What's the ch probability of you passing it on the fifth or sixth time? It's pretty low. Yeah. So. You know what's crazy? I remember, and maybe this is aging myself, but when John F. Kennedy Jr. was struggling to pass the bar. I remember and that, yeah. It, right, and it was so shocking because, well, he was just way too handsome not to pass the bar. But, yeah. you know, it was a Kennedy, right? And I remember thinking, like, when they were like, well, John F. Kennedy didn't pass the bar. I was like, that's all right. Now he's seen it. He knows what's on it. He's going to go in for a second time and he's he's got an advantage. He's going to be fine. And I remember somebody said to me, somebody who happened to be an attorney, that the chances decrease with every retake. So I had heard this like 
sort of idea before I'd ever entered a profession that requires a standardized test. And it still to this day sort of baffles me. I have to reorganize my brain on the things that I know to be true versus how crazy it is to me that exposure doesn't increase your chances. Like now you know what to expect. Now you should know what to study. That should help. And a lot of my students will say, you know what, I'm just going to go in. I'm just going to take it and see what happens. And I'm like, well, I know that seems like really a great idea. Like, what do you have to lose? And then I have to remind myself, except for there's this data that sort of says there is something to lose. Like, this might not be a good idea. And I still baffle with how uh, making sense of that, you know. Regardless of your title, if you are a behavior consultant who is working in or with schools and you are struggling and wondering why your interventions are not producing the desired results, you are not alone. Unfortunately, those tasked with improving behavior in schools are too often left to carry the burden by themselves. You are the behavior person, so you take care of it, is the unsaid mantra. But you can't improve behavior and the associated outcomes by yourself. In fact, Creating sustainable improvement in student behavior almost always requires changes in the performance of the educators. I'm Dr. Pauly, and along with my colleagues Anika Costa and Matt Sicoria, we are designing coursework called the Behavioral Toolbox. In it, you will be taught strategies grounded in organizational behavior management for consulting in schools in a way that brings out the best in educators so they can bring out the best in the students they serve. If this sounds exciting, be sure to click on the link in the description to sign up for more information. Eventually, we w- I'd like to move on to other aspects of the exam other than than, than not passing it because yeah. you know the majority of people do. And well, but it, I, I can't help but to add, you know think think this through with you guys here. But I had a recent experience where you know I have three teenagers in the household, and and one of them finished driver's ed and promptly took the driver's test. And he didn't pass. He was really, and he was he just totally like missed a sign or something like that. And we don't get to go with them to, so I wasn't, sh- you know, so we had, we, we had, he had to like retell it and, and then it got in his head. <laughs> and then like the second time he took it, he, 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 he just had a brain fart and just uh, messed something else up. And it, and it was all in his mind. Cause I was, you know, he was driving with us all the time. I was putting him through situations where he had to make, you know, various decisions. So I was trying to be very deliberate about the 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 stimuli that he would encounter along in in the general area where they take the test. We drove around that area a ton, back and forth, up and down, and things like that. Eventually, he had, he has his license now, so I guess the, the had had a you know a good uh, good a good ending certainly. And I'm just happy that I don't have to drive in the football practice all the time. But it it was it was a total. It was just, it was nerves. It was 100% nerves. So I was going to, you know, we were going to talk about what people's barriers might be who's, who do struggle with the test. And when I originally thought to ask that question, when I was formulating that, you know, I was thinking like, okay, what are the technical aspects of of of, of the test material that, that people might struggle with? I want to do get to that that aspect of the question, but what, what are you guys hearing about the, you know, the test anxiety, the nerves and things like that from your from your customers as as one of those factors to weigh in in how people might prepare for the exam. I mean, I hear a lot. I didn't pass because I'm not a good test taker. I get anxious. I have anxiety. I try to really dis. I try to dissuade people from you know giving themselves sort of like a diagnostic mentalistic feature because what are we going to do about that? So I always try to have help them operationalize, like what what does that really mean? And for a lot of people, what it really comes down to is that when they're not feeling prepared, when they don't really feel in command of the things they're responsible for knowing, it does increase your nervousness, of course, because I think being nervous for a big exam that's got these pass rates and that's sort of notorious, I mean, I think you are going to be nervous whether... I, I would imagine that some of the leadership in the field, if we gave them the test right now, would be nervous about taking it. So I just I, I would be frightened. I'm just gonna hey. put it out there. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, right. So it, I think the nerves are normal, you know, uh, for lack of a better word. It's just, you know, if you add to those nerves uncertainty, you know, negative experiences, maybe some knowledge gaps and whatever, then of course it it could be more debilitating and it could offset, you know, any logic or rational thinking that you would have. 
But I don't know that I subscribe to anxiety unless you have anxiety as a diagnosis, which means then you're going to be anxious under any stress and any situations. And then that's obviously going to get even worse when the situation is actually, you know, scary for every normal, you know, typically neurotic person. So I think that's kind of where I place that. But I hear it. I think that's often what people like to define as the thing that's holding them back. And I think that's problematic. I think they need to define it. They need to define it actually better if they want to uh, pass as a retaking, as a retaker. Yeah, I, I, I don't have too much to say about anxiety per se, but, but just what, what people tend to focus on is, is a concern for me. Because I remember talking to lots of customers who, you know, they, they've failed the exam several times and they said, well, I'm, I said, you know, what have you been doing? They said, well, I'm doing my SAF meds and I'm doing, you know, this memorization type of activities. You know, SAF meds are great, but not, but, but to pass the exam, you need to know how to apply this stuff. So if you're focusing on something that really you learned a couple, two or three or four years ago, and you're just rehashing that same content, you're not learning new stuff you're not learning how to apply the material so that is is one thing and then i i get the sense and i of course i have no data to support this but it just seems like a lot of the people on social media just get on there and and kind of complain and 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 just are are they're looking for a hack you know they're looking for what can i do to to just pass this exam and really, what you need to do is you just need to buckle down and study and, 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 you know, get into the zone and, and really focus on, on the material that you're given. So that, that's, that's my response to that. I think people who, who can really get into the zone and, and of course, I know life gets in the way and a lot of people that are preparing for the test to have kids and whatnot, but, but, and that's that's one of those barriers. So. Yeah, you know, I was just going to mention that, you know, I had the luxury of preparing for the exam when, you know, I mean, I was working full time, but I didn't have kids at the time. I didn't have, you know, much in the way of other responsibilities. And uh, I was able to get up at, I don't know, I would get up at like 5, 530. I would bang out some modules and then <laughs> I would go to work and then I would probably study for like another hour. You know, just going through the modules and the and the and the materials probably for another hour after dinner, and I did that for several weeks. And I, but I, I, you know, I wasn't pregnant. I wasn't, you know, juggling all sorts of other things. I wasn't running kids to daycare. I wasn't, you know, caring for you know a parent who you know things like that. So I see, I see a lot of these stories online as well. When I, you know, read these accounts, I, you know. You could see why people do that as a source of support as, as people are trying to you know get encouragement and things like that. so I, I I'm glad you brought that last point up, Steve, because there is it's important to, to to keep all of those things in mind and and at the same time, it doesn't discount the the the, the basics of finding some time to review the material in whatever way that that you choose to. I, I agree with you that, that social media can be a source of support, and that could be a very positive effect. I, I worry about people who just uh, obsess over it. And, yeah, and, and fair enough. Sorry, I, was, I was no, no, that's right. I was going to add that I think I think that's what I meant is that you know when you just you know as decent and you're just sort of on social media to commiserate. What you're not doing is identifying these things that are causing you the the anxiety, as you had said, or the the grief about the situation. And instead looking at, okay, the reason I didn't pass and the reason that I feel this, what I'm defining as anxious is because I have a lack of time. And so then organizing in such a way that you think, okay, you know what? I, I have kids. I have other responsibilities that are my, maybe above and beyond what somebody should have when they're in this stage of their professional life. So what does that mean for me? Um, maybe I can't wake up three hours early as I, by the way, did the same thing with modules and coffee for months and months at 5 a.m. or something unreasonable. But not everybody can do that at 5 a.m. or they need that sleep because they've got such a big day of taking care of others. 
So then identifying, you know, how do I get the time in? Because it doesn't matter. You you still need to get that time in. It just has to, you have to be more creative about it. And I think when people get caught up in talking about, you know, their disappointment and their frustration, what they don't end up doing is identifying the barrier and then thinking about creative behavior analytic ways of addressing that barrier. And maybe someone like you and I at our, the phases that we were testing, we could set up to pass within three to six months, right? But maybe someone with less daily time would just have to think, well, I just need to do less, but over a longer period. But but I agree that there's a lot of support, but also a lot of things that are problematic about but, you know, the reinforcement provided by social media, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I just get come back to like, if I took that test, I think I was like 20, let's see, how old was it? 26, I think. 25, 26 when I took the exam. I, anyway, you know, if, if I if I took the exam at, you know, 35 or 36, you know, it would have been a whole different ball game in terms of time allocation and the, the right. lack thereof, I suppose. So, all right. So we talked about some barriers related to you know, anxiety and certainly time and whatnot. So let's get to the, I guess, you know, what, what are, what are, you, are, are there consistent themes that people are struggling with as it relates to the content area of the exam? Are there commonalities? Oh, you know, like when I took the exam, there was the standard, there was still standard acceleration information on it. And I remember at the time saying, okay, I'm going to try to, you know, I, I actually understand it a, a better than I now than when it, you know, there's no, you know, no one's testing me on it. I've come to appreciate the chart way more so than I did at the time. At the time, it was just this abstraction. And I had to learn a few terms enough to get close to guessing the right answer. You know, is, is, there, a, is there a modern equivalent of, of, of that type of section of the exam? Again, I, I, I don't really pay a lot of attention to the content of the exam these days as I'm, you know, it's, it's been a while since I've done supervision. And I, you know, I'm just obviously, you know, 20 plus years out of taking taking the test, the task list has evolved, you know, a couple of times, et cetera, et cetera. So what what do you see as as things that people typically have a hard time mastering? I I would say stimulus equivalence is a is a tough part, tough area. People still struggle with ethics and in a, in a sense that's a little bit of a moving target. MO, experimental design. What's that? I was going to say experimental design. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Experimental design is tough for people. I just had a conversation with someone actually today, somebody who heads a university program. And um, and this 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 comes up a lot. I think Steve, you and I have even talked about this in some of our conversations. It almost feels like there should be two exams. There should be exam that is, you know, slightly modified to address the really practical aspects of the frontline supervisor, right? So the person that's not going to be on a daily basis using the the jargoniest parts of the vocabulary, even though they're talking about the same things and they're seeing the word behave the world behavior analytically, they understand that the environment has to be manipulated for behavior to change, but they're not speaking about it like that. They're speaking about it in practical stakeholder you know, how to communicate with stakeholder ways. And then they get this exam, which is literally describing things they know very well, but the vocabulary gets really heady and textbooky. And, you know, there's so many, there's so many words for the same concept because, you know, it's still such a new field. People are just, you know, freely creating vocabulary as they, you know, publish. And I, and then, and then there's that academic researcher going to be in the lab doing that EAB version of behavior analysis or with the EAB version of all this. And those are two very different people with two different capacities for learning, two different learning styles, two different applications. And this exam, I think probably, I haven't seen it in a long time as well, but I would bet favors, well, I won't say that because I don't know that this is true, but I was going to say, I think it needs to, you know, get a little more difficult for that experimental person and maybe a little less jargony for the applied frontliner who may not have anticipated even going to this level in their education. They might have just been like a really good caregiver that grew into this world and realized they have a talent. And now they're having to get this sciencey education that does not really connect to what they're excelling in, which is, you know, treating people in a home or a school. And and I would say that's what makes experimental design stimulus equivalence difficult to connect because if we really sat down and simplified it, people would understand all that this experiment is saying is that what you're doing every day works. And this graph tells you, use this thing because look, research shows and stimulus equivalence is, you know, 
That's how you're, everything you've done has led your kid to be able to form frames and connect the world. And it, look at that. They learned this, all this because you programmed for generalization. But then you say transitivity and, you know, and then it's like, well, what the heck is that? <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, I, I, oh, go ahead, Steve. There's all, my whole career, there's been this, this kind of struggle of, uh, and, and discussion or, or issue or controversial about having a, a dual repertoire. You need, our technical repertoire for talking amongst ourselves and our our more lay repertoire that that is good for communicating with the public and you know I, I think I think a lot of people would say you know a lot of the people that at least I look up to is you, you do need both repertoires and and I, I remember Jack Michael really you know, being on the stump about, you know, you got to talk right. You got to talk, talk. He's the jargoniest of them all. Yeah. Well, that's what he meant. He he says, you need to use the jargon <laughs> among our, you know, at least among, among us. And, you know, but, but we, we've also, we also know that, you know, if you go in to a meeting and you start talking with, with colleagues, uh, non-behavioral colleagues about MOs and, and, and habituation and extinction. Yeah, it's it's you know, lose people in a way, and they they think you're being elitist, and you probably are. And <laughs> <laughs> so you really need the those those two repertoires. And because if you if you if you go too much in the 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 lay direction, then you lose your your ability. I think to think behaviorally. You know, I, you, for, for instance, when you're, when you're in grad school, ideally, hopefully you're, you're immersed in a, in a verbal community that, that reinforces all this technical language and technical way of thinking. And then when you leave that, that bubble and you go out and work in the real world, you know, depending on the environment that you're in, they're either going to, you know, support that repertoire or they're going to, perhaps punish it or at least put it on its on extinction and you know it you know some phrases that that i've always often heard out in the real world is is you know things like he'll he'll do it if he wants to you know talking about their client he'll he'll behave if he wants to and it's like mm -hmm. ah you know that, that's like fingernails on a chalkboard you know or 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 he didn't have any behaviors today <laughs> you know, so he's dead. He's going to have papers tomorrow, but he's dead to the, you know, and, and I've, you know, mostly that's non-behavioral. Yeah. I reinforced him. Yeah. I reinforced him. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, it's it, uh, actually at the recent verbal behavior conference, Anar Ingerson had a really interesting talk on this. And I, I, I think what I'm going to do is probably have him on to explore this further rather than maybe mischaracterize his position on this but he had some interesting nuance about th this kind of you know the, the reading the room if you will and 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 knowing what what mode what gear to select and in, in your in your verbal repertoire but I, I do think your point is is interesting steve in terms of using the technical language so you can think through a problem in a clinical manner that perhaps doesn't get as much emphasis as you know plain language please which is you know the you know what what pat Fryman likes to say and 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 both are correct yeah i mean it's it's but it's pat not Fryman it's, did not take the exam well that's true so <laughs> he probably took a bunch of other exams at some point or another but you know i uh we still like him still yeah well, he's still him. <laughs> we'll still have we'll still have him around i guess all right, we're going to take a quick break here. And as we were just talking about the, in this episode, you know, balancing work and life can be difficult. And that's why the University of Cincinnati Online designed a Master's of Education in Behavior Analysis program. It's 100% online and asynchronous. What that means is that you log on when it works for you. Their student success coordinators will work with you from start all the way until graduation to ensure you are receiving the support you need. You can graduate in as few as five semesters from a top 10 program in total number of graduates and prepare for the BCBA exam. The program is FAFSA eligible, and the University of Cincinnati also offers a business partnership program to offer tuition discounts to eligible employees. 
If you want to learn more, go to online.uc.edu and click the Request Info button. All right, let's get back to the rest of this interview. Yeah, well, about the research design, I'm wondering you know, if, if this difficulty with that is something that has become more pronounced over the years. And this is just, this is a random thought. This has no bearing in data or whatnot. But, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, if, if behavior analysts of, you know, 15, 25, 30 years ago came more out of psychology, experimental psychology programs, where even if, even if there wasn't an emphasis in single case design, there was some grounding of your graduate education and research design more generally that, you know, that, that test takers might have had more just general baseline knowledge under a foundation on which to build might have been more robustly established. And as, you know, perhaps as, as you know, people are entering, you know, uh, graduate programs from a variety of backgrounds, you know, uh, special education, you know, other, other backgrounds, uh, other, other programs that perhaps have less of a research emphasis and more of a, an applied teaching emphasis or what have you. Uh, I don't know. Again, this is pure speculation. I don't know if that's something that you guys ha- have seen over time. You know, I guess I'm, I'm wondering if the experimental design, the problems with the, the barriers associated with that are, you know, might be getting worse over the years. And I don't know if that's, that's true or not, but I'm wondering what you guys think about that more generally. No, I don't know if I would say it's getting worse at all. I, I think I think it's just scary to people and it's a barrier before it's a barrier. So if if their coursework did not produce a lot of experimental focus, like they covered it because they knew they had to, or like some of the online courses where they literally didn't do any experimenting, even to sample it, for example, then I just think people think of it as this foreign language. And just that alone is a barrier because you're afraid of it. You think it's something unrelatable, something that you couldn't possibly grasp because it's just so like heady and above whatever your pay grade, if you will. I think it's absolutely attainable. And I think that, you know, ideally they they teach it more relatably. And then if not, then Steve and I will be there to pick up the pieces and, <laughs> you know, make it exam passable for people if they never need to see it again, you know, especially. Yeah, I, I I really don't know why people have so much trouble, but I, I would agree with with Donna that it hasn't really gotten worse. It's just always been okay. A Very thing. Thing. Yeah. Well, this is a good time maybe to transition on on what what is working and how you guys do what you do. So we've for we've spent a lot of time discussing how people get sidetracked and whatnot. So let's talk about how people become successful in in taking the exam. And I'd like to talk about the specific approaches and what's maybe common and what's different between the way both of your companies go about preparing test takers. So, uh, Steve, why don't you talk about the uh, the how how BDS approaches it, and then and then Donna will will talk about how how you how you do it. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, of course, we begin with the task list, and then from the task list, we you know look at the material the Cooper Heron Heward and and other resources that that cover that material and then we didn't develop learning objectives and the, the learning objectives aren't but we don't show those to the they're, they're not on the platform they're just behind the scenes but there are are hundreds of learning objectives or there might be a thousand of them you know a lot so from the learning objectives we we developed our questions and and most of our questions are multiple choice a handful are fill in the blank and and we also use bloom's taxonomy a, a modified bloom's taxonomy to 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 rate our our questions and we we you know begin with definitional questions and and conceptual questions and we go to examples and then applied questions and applied questions is, of course, the the very important ones. Those are probably most like the ones that are going to be on the exam. Oh, and let me say here for a minute. Sometimes people come to our table and say, there's questions on the exam that I saw on your modules. <laughs> and, I, and I say to them, no, you didn't. They're, 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 <laughs> they're, 
or or maybe they didn't say they're they're the same questions, but they say very similar questions. And and I say, nope, absolutely not. We have no inside information. Nobody gives us anything. And but we have over four thousand questions in the CBA learning module series, and there's like 180 on the exam. So there's bound to be a few that are going to be similar. There's only so many ways to ask. Yeah, there can't not be considerable right. overlap under certain circumstances. Right. So so anyway, you know, that's that's how we develop it. And then of course for each question we provide immediate feedback, corrective feedback for every incorrect option. And then we have people do the modules to fluency. So that's that's basically our our instructional design model. And 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 there's a time element still, right? Do you still have that? Yes, yeah. we do. They we, now, unlike when you took the the modules, it was all in one. Now we have have it separated into two modules, the same exact question into two modules. We call that a set. And the first of that set is a, what we call the acquisition version, and we just set the timer for that, which for an hour, which is way more time than you need. And then after you achieve a hundred percent on the acquisition module. Then you go to the fluency module, which usually the timer for that is five minutes. So, and it's usually about 20 questions. So that means you're responding about four times a minute. And, and we also have people rotate through the module so that they don't do the same module in the same set back to back. You do a module in one set, then you do a module into an, in another set, and then a the third set and the fourth set. Then you go back to that first first set and do that. That that helps people, helps to prevent them from memorizing the answers but not learning the content. I you see. have a pre-test and post-test now too, right, Steve, since Matthew and I did it? Yes, we do. We do. And oh, and, and we also have a hint for each question. Oh, yes. I remember that. I yeah. Remember the hint. Yep. <laughs> but, you know, and, and I know we wanted to get into this, Donna, because Donna and I had this discussion about a week or so ago about about mock exams. We, we do have a pre-test and a post-test, and, and we have unit tests, which which I think the unit tests are more for professors to use to evaluate mastery. But the mock exams... You know, I resisted putting in a mock exam for for the longest time because I thought it's really not that helpful. It gives people a false sense of security or pa- perhaps a false sense of insecurity. And and then they, they want the answers to the test. And we don't give them the answers to the test. But what we do give them for the mock exam, we will tell them, since you missed this question, here's what you need to study. Because if you just give them the answer, chances are they're going to remember the answer to that question, and there's not going to be a generalization effect. But if you tell them what to study, it's like, okay, so this is your weak area. Go go look at that. And we tried that. We got so many bullying emails. I paid for this. I want the answer. And I just recently actually succumbed. I was just like, I can't be abused by students anymore. They're stressed, and they're putting it on me. But you're absolutely right. I couldn't agree more with the mock exam flaw. Well, you know I agree. So so if I could speak a little bit more generally about that is everybody, particularly on <laughs> me, it's like everybody wants a mock exam. Where can I get a mock exam? And and then, you know, people take those mock exams and they think that that is somehow predictive of of their success on the on the actual exam. And there's no you know, they're obviously not the psychometric evaluations that have been done with that. I'm sure that we can develop a mock exam and we'll give you a 99%, you know, and you go into the test thinking, oh, oh I got this. I'm, yeah, I got this a piece of cake and then you end up failing it. And, and I know we can make harder mock, mock exams too. So the mock exams are, uh, unfortunately, people want those, but they don't do much good. The, for us, the mock exam is not a really high predictor of how you're going to do on the exam. For us, the the predictor is completing all the modules. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and and, and I, I know you went through the fluency piece uh, quickly, but I, I think it's important to kind of hover over, go back and hover over that just for a moment. I can remember 
clear as a day, sitting in the dining room table of my house in Wilmington, Delaware, with my laptop, swearing out loud, banging the table, <laughs> you know, doing all sorts of things that people would have a hard time imagining me doing, I suppose, and, and perhaps don't know me personally. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, missing some, missing one of those modules by seconds, you know, and just oh. being just completely just coming unglued because I had to do the, the, the darn okay. thing over again, all over again. And, and, and I, I will say that when I, when I took the exam, finally, I took it at some random, I took it at some college, some like professional college you know, on the, in the Philadelphia suburbs. I can't even remember what it was. And there was probably a room full of maybe 20 people. And this is, this was in May of 2002. I think I was the first one done and I was freaking out waiting for, I, you know, again, I took the test with, with my colleague Cheryl and, and I was freaking out waiting for you know, everyone else to finish up and I'm like pacing up and down the halls. But I think I, I and, and luckily it, it worked out, I, I, I passed, but I, I think the, the fluency not only helped me learn the material, but it helped me actually do the test quite quickly. Uh, and, and, and so I think as frustrating as that experience was, for me, I don't know if I would have pushed myself to learn the material in the, in, in a, and, and produce the correct answers at a sufficient rate to be successful if I didn't have that pressure on me. So I, I, I don't know what, I, I don't know if there are any, you know, kind of data that you guys have internally that speak to that or just anecdotal reports from, from customers or, or, or whatnot, but. I guess to what extent extent is my experience, uh, you know, representative? Or if can you talk a little bit more generally about about that? Because I also that's also something I see online. People are like I'm scarred for life from the BDS modules because I get so you know, <laughs> you know. So yes. talk well, talk a we, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, we we do get a lot of people say yes, it was the fluency that was really helpful because then I went in and started sit, taking the exam. And I was like, okay, this is easy. And then they, they sometimes tell us that the, the modules are more difficult than the test. And and that's something that we're we're happy to take that, whether they they mean that as a compliment or a criticism. So and yes, the, we do get get some people complain that it's just too much material and it's it's too difficult. So but but I think certainly the the fluency element is is important and helpful to a lot of people. Yeah, it was, it, you know, again, I'm, it was huge for me, certainly. And, and, and again, I, I don't think I would have pushed myself on my own to, you know, to, to, to learn the material at that, at that level of, you know, automaticity, essentially. So anyway, that's, that's, uh, you know, that, that's your end of one, I guess. Hey everyone, as a BCBA, meeting your continuing ed needs can be challenging at times. That's why I have made selected episodes of the Behavioral Observations podcast available for Type 2 continuing education credits. That's right. You can meet a portion of your professional development requirements on the go. Currently, we have CEs for topics including functional assessment, ethics, and supervision. Come learn from podcast favorites such as Greg Hanley, Pat Fryman, Mark Dixon, as well as many other amazing guests. For more information, head on over to behavioralobservations.com forward slash get CEs. What is uh so what is what is the instructional philosophy for for pass the big ABA exam? How do- I think philosophically we're we're very similar. Um, it's funny Steve just uh, recently introduced me to the Bloom's taxonomy, so I'd started reading about it, and oddly enough, we've sort of worked in those elements. I I have this sort of acronym that I use with my students, which is MAC. Um, it's out of order, but it just is easier to memorize, which is memorization, application, comprehension, which is the first three elements of Bloom's taxonomy. Thank you, Steve, for introducing me. And then obviously the thing that I'm missing is the other three, right? I think it's analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. I think analysis and evaluation occurs within our program. And and I think synthesis does too, not in, in the way that the modules kind of repeat and, you know, unify the same material in different ways, which was incredibly effective. But for us, what I really started, what I did was I first sort of defined, and by the way, did this 
into the program. Like we didn't start off with this like really clear model. We kind of were like, let's do this thing. And we started doing it and making mistakes and learning from those mistakes. But now it's definitely systematic. I think I thought to myself, okay, students need to memorize a lot of vocabulary. So that's like phase one. So what are some things that people do to memorize? And I think we already talked about, you know, obviously SAF meds or flashcards or just reading or listening, watching, doing the BDS modules absolutely builds up those memorization pieces just because of the repetition. And then I thought, okay, well, once you've memorized, there's people who are brilliant rote memorizers who can literally memorize anything. And that's good enough for the GRE. You can go in, you'll know all the vocabulary words, but this is not like that. So now what do you do if rote memorization doesn't work for you? That's me. It doesn't work for me. So now what do you do to take all of that memorized content and now actually understand it? So then we build in tools to enhance understanding. And we sort of structure it like a university course. There's lecture, you uh, you know, it's it's recorded, the le- lecture, so you can watch them over and over again so that if, you know, you get distracted by your family, you can pause it and come back later. And then there was the application piece. And there's, I mean, there's more to it, but I don't think you need me to give you the whole company sales pitch now. And then the, and then the application piece, which is obviously, I sort of look at that as generalization, like taking everything that you know, combining that with some you know, a specific repertoire of like behavior skill, like uh, test taking skills, and then taking that to the big day and putting all of that together. And hopefully it all unites beautifully. And so we incorporate teaching them how to memorize, teaching them how to comprehend, then having them take a weekly test and then come to class where we break it down, dissect it, go through every single thing where we're in, we're sort of reinforcing the, the knowledge, the comprehension, the memorization, while also adding the test taking skill to that process. So as I'm breaking down questions, that's done interactively and live. So unlike the lectures and the manual, which they can read, you know, anytime. But I think as Steve said, we do have mock exams and we do have to disclaim a lot because that I think that is a problem with the field is that with people prepping for the exam, I should say, is that I'm I'm stalking all those Facebook pages too, because I'm curious about what students need and And one of the things we do hear a lot is, you know, anybody have a mock exam or how did you do on this person's mock? Was Mm. that a good indicator for how you did on the exam? Or I got a, you know, 65 on this mock and anybody get a 65 and pass and things like that. So that scares me because that's not very behavior analytic. That's looking, that's not very single subject of everybody. And on top of it, they're just taking exam after exam after exam. And I've even had students take our exams multiple times and then send an email and say, guess what? I finally got, after my third or fourth time with mock number one, I finally got that 70, you know, 6%. And I'm just like, oh no. Yeah, because you've repeated it. You've done it multiple times. You've memorized some pieces. So we we have to create so many disclaimers in our classes to make sure that people don't celebrate, you know, these sort of false senses of hope. And we really, really try to encourage everybody you know, like with every mock question, I have the specific task list area that the question is from. And I say, if you got this wrong, please don't study this question. Go back to this section because the chance that the next time you have a question from this section, that it's going to be identical to the one we wrote. Sure, it's possible. Like Steve, we have a bazillion questions, but it's also equally highly unlikely. So please know this section. And that I think is, I don't know about you, Stephen. I feel like we've talked about this too, but I feel like that's my plight. Like, I feel like I want to travel towns across the country and stop by student centers and just be like, hey guys, just making sure you're not studying only mock exams. I know they're fun and I know they're like immediately reinforcing because you get a score and you get feedback, but uh, it's not going to help. And I interview students who call and say, I failed. Why should I take your class? And I ask them, what have you done? And usually it's, you know, they name off 10 or 15 mocks. And so that's very superficial. They they learn how to pass those mocks. You, you need exactly. like the cardboard sign to hold up, you know, or the sandwich board, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, that's, why, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to, you know, that t-shirt we were talking about before we started. I'm going right. to get that one that says no yeah. more mocks. But I I do love a mock and I think it is great because there is so much to learn on the practical application side. I just hate that people rely on it as their primary feedback. We What we typically say is if you can go down item by item down that task list, however you get there, like let's just take out the, the all the possibilities of applying, of getting fluent. If you can go down task list item by item and sit here like we're talking right now and talk about any one of those concepts 
uh, concepts as a professional. Like, you know, we can sit here, laugh and cry about any section of the task list. If you can say it, explain it, teach it or do it tomorrow, you're probably okay. Yeah. But your knowledge is kind of superficial and it's kind of like, isn't that the thing where you've got the thing? And and they're not talking about it like it's their own, that like it's the language of their field. And I also, I love to use the, how well would you want your doctor to do on this exam? Like, do you want him to have taken some, you know, crash course and memorized some terms? And then next time you see him, he's just like, well, I passed the test. I never read Cooper. It was, it was you know, assuming Cooper was a medical book. And I hate when people say, you know, uh, your manual really broke it down for me. I could not get through Cooper. I just put that book away and I relied exclusively on your manual. Then I'm like, what is my legacy? <laughs> what have I done to the field? And I have to often tell students, please don't learn this from me. Review it with me. Let me help you. Let me help remind you. Maybe it's been a year or two since you've seen it, but please don't learn it from me. That's not what I'm out here to do. Anyway. You don't want to, you don't want to turn yourself into the uh, the University of American Samoa to uh, use a Better Call Saul reference. I'll put a I'll put a Wikipedia link in that. Uh, yes, please show do. Notes for that. Yeah, but I don't want people to be like the worst PCB ever and be like, you know, yeah, I really don't know this, but thank God, thanks PTB. You know, I just that's <laughs> not the legacy I want. You know, helps it helps the statistics, I guess, but you know, I I want to be part of the this the field growing in a positive direction. You know. But, so, so to your, you know, to, to piggyback on that, then what have you guys seen? I guess you know, one, one, how, and and in many ways, I think you've already answered this question, but I, I want to ask it more directly in case there were additional thoughts on it. But you know, there's passing the exam certainly, with, and, and I think anyone who's you know crammed for it, and, and some, I don't want to liken it cramming for like a like a college midterm. It's it's a professional examination, and I want to I don't want to belittle it or anything like that. But can't cram for you know, it. Yeah. Well, yeah, but let's just say someone passes it, and they they you know how do you prepare people to really learn the concepts at a deep level in su- in such a way that they in- incorporate into their practice as opposed to I'm going to learn this set of facts to pass the exam. And and not really retain them, you know. And I, and I and and obviously, again, we were joking around about having to, te- you know, pass the, the exam today, you know. And certainly, I don't. I, the task list obviously is very different than than where it was when I when I took the exam. And I certainly, but I, I would also say that there, there are elements of the task list that I don't interact with on a daily basis, just because we're all specialized in various ways. But I guess more generally, though, like, you know, how, how do you how do you prevent people from just l- learning the facts long enough to pass the exam and then, you know, not not learning the material at a, at a more uh, deeper and profound level? Well, we, you know, I, I say a lot that I our job is not to to help you pass the exam. Our job is to make you a better behavior analyst. And mm. uh, that, you know, might be more aspirational than actual i i don't know i i hope i hope it's it's actual but you know <clears throat> looking at at exam prep i see it more as just more education you know it's it's not a it's not a hack it's it's a way it's just a way to learn learn more material or or learn it Either learn more, maybe learn something that you hadn't had in in grad school, or relearn it or re re review it. But anyway, it's in either way, it's it's a deeper education, and and we we address address that somewhat, Matt, through just the the depth of our questioning. You know, we might have one objective that has. 10 questions to address that one objective. And, you know, like I said, lots of applications, you know, over 4,000 questions. And with TCO6 coming out, which is really going to be out later this month, we're, we're looking at, you know, a, a few more questions. I don't, I don't know how many more, but a, a few more, I believe. So, but, you know, there, there's what you can teach in a classroom you know, with a professor lecturing and doing homework assignments. And there's what we can do online, whether it be live or 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 asynchronous self-study like we do. 
and it, it's got its limits. We're, we're not putting hands on kids, you know, and, and so that we have to rely on the mentorship part of the, the BACB's certification program. That's, that's where that's got to come from. Actually not knowing what a functional analysis is, but actually doing it is got to be, got to be direct. And so yeah. there's, and there's all the soft skills that go along with that, you know, how to, how to interact with parents, how to interact with clients, how to, how to deal with difficult people in a meeting and so on and so forth. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's like a couple of legs on, on that stool. That Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Jim Carr talks about the, the BACB certification process being a three-legged school, the, the mentorship, the coursework and the, um, and the exam. Mm-hmm. You got to have all three of those legs. I see. So, so it might occur to some people listening to this show that you know you, you guys are you guys are competitors, but yet you're you're very collegial. How did this? You know, I, I know you mentioned a little bit of it er, earlier, but if you could elaborate more on how you guys are, you know, start to interact and, and develop this relationship, and I know you guys have gotten together and talk about this stuff on 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 a podcast as well. I want to give the opportunity to talk about that too. So, yeah, tell us a little bit about how you guys are, are working together, because, well, because you know, to, to the to the to the random listener that's like, oh, this is interesting. They're you know they're you know yeah. fishing in the same pond, you know, but they you know, they you know here they are being uh, you know quite collegial. So, um, well, I'll let Steve share his motivation because it it really is mostly a testament to Steve because he was the you know I kind of call him the father of exam prep, the founding father of exam prep. You know, when we started to put this program together, I reached out to Steve many times. And I, when we started to think that this was going to go beyond our little study groups and things like that. So I reached out to him to let him know we were coming, not because I thought, you know, watch out for us. Here we come. I not for never for a second did I think or even consider what was going to happen to like market share or anything. I didn't even know those words at the time, but just mostly to introduce ourselves. And I had some questions and I didn't think of ourselves as anything close to a competitor at the time. And and Steve was incredibly generous. And then through the years, I would always seek him out at conferences and we would talk and that turned into lunches and dinners and very, very late nights in hotel lobbies. Um, and people would come up to us and would be like, wait a minute, aren't you guys the competition? And I mean, we've We've gone to dinner with our significant others. We've we've danced at parties. And I just, I mean, for me, I just like Steve very much. And so I enjoy my time with him. And the fact that we have this unique common experience just makes it more fun because there's not a lot of people out there that I can talk to about my day-to-day experience in this field. And, and he not only experiences it, he's such an expert in it. And he always gears me towards science in a way that I probably may not have rooted myself because he's, you know, because he's a PhD and he comes from such a, just such a strong scientific foundation, much more so than, than I do. But I love Steve's story as to why he was so kind. So I'll, I'll let him share well, it unless it's changed, Steve, unless you're like, well. <laughs> no, no. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for those kind words, Dawn. I, I appreciate that. And I, I feel likewise. I mean, I think we've been, been a help to each other and, and it's, it's nice to, to have a, a competitor to to talk to and and bounce ideas and and maybe kind of vent over <laughs> common <laughs> common frustrations, but you know I I have to to say I have to give credit going backwards to to Jose Martinez Diaz because when I started started out Jose was doing his guided review and and I remember. A, and and I had kn- known beha- known Jose before that, but I I do recall being at Faba, and out on the balcony, a beautiful you know September evening, and and he he comes up to me and says, "Hey Steve, how you doing?" And you know the way he does, I can't imitate it very well, but you know the people who know Jose knows his <laughs> very friendly friendly way of interacting with people but anyway he said steve we're we're competitors but you know let's not compete let's let's work together and and he 
just his attitude, you know, of, of one of collegiality as opposed to, you know, competitiveness, I think was kind of, kind of set the stage for me and, and, you know, moving forward to, for others as well. So I, I give him a lot of credit because I didn't really, you know, <clears throat> I was in business for the first time. I didn't know what really yeah. what business was like. And, and I do know that, you know, you, you tend to think of business as being cutthroat and all that, and 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 it can be. And I was expecting that that was an an, an inevitability, but it it really isn't. So, so that that's that's my story. And I hope I hope that that attitude of congeniality, collegiality, and congeniality, you know, continues in our field. And yeah, might- that's. A- that's a good point, Steve. At the end of there's a uh, an episode I haven't released yet. I'm not sure if it'll be out before or after this one, but I I talked to the guest about the importance of these. You know what he calls he's from a different industry. And he calls these mastermind groups where you've got business owners. Sometimes for, they're from different parts of the country, serving different you know geographical areas. So th- there might not necessarily be competition from a from from that standpoint. If it's more a business that serves local markets. But they get together and they, you know, there's, you know, and the way they do it, actually, there's like a structured process to it where they're, you know, they talk about like, you know, what are your, you know, what, what your, they meet on regular intervals and things along those lines. So there may be some of that stuff that we can learn as behavior analysts because there are a lot of behavior analysts. To, you know, it is interesting what a, you know, how many cottage industries that applied behavior analysis has, has, has given birth to in the last, you know, in the last two decades or so, you know, whether it's test taking or, you know, software, you know, practice management stuff. And, you know, it, it just goes on and on and on the, the, the booths at the, the, the ABA expo just get, you know, the, 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 just get more and more. So it's, it is pretty, pretty fascinating. I was going to say, I think it's so important because, you know, before I entered test prep and before, you know, I, I was in a, you know, in, in this sort of this position of meeting more people through having a, a successful business in ABA, I felt like such an outsider and I, and like I was living on my own I- island clinically, like I was, you know, doing going to see clients and coming home at night and not connecting with people and then going to conferences and seeing the what, what was considered back then the leadership and feeling like so other from those people. But I really learned quickly that most most people in our industry are pretty warm and eager to support other people. And uh, most of the friends that I now have in the field, I met through just connecting with someone and then being really surprised that they were as kind or like-minded as I was, or seeing them do something maybe, maybe on that awful Facebook, Steve, right? Uh, Where kind of going, wow, they, they have this interest as well. And just feeling some sort of connectivity. And I, I really try to do the same for anybody who reaches out to me for advice or if they come up to me at a conference and are like, what are you and your friends doing for lunch? Well, come, you know, come with us. And because it is very lonely and it is very hard to make friends unless you went to one of the fancy schools and your entire class is at the conference and you're at the reunion dinners and, you know, your mentor is there facilitating networking events. So I think Steve just really, for me, modeled that because it didn't come from that culture whatsoever. I, I, if you were going to teach me about the cutthroat of business, Steve, then you for sure failed that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I think you know, for I think for years it was kind of like you know we we talked carefully, right? But I think now, like I share things with Steve that maybe I wouldn't have early on, just from not knowing or understanding. And and for you know, for me, he's a safe space, and I I also respect that very much. So I know that if I were to set out to do anything that I thought would you know, be a challenge to what he's doing. I would not do it without speaking to him or, you know, not that I, Steve, you have nothing to worry about of nothing on the horizon, but I just wouldn't step on his toes now, especially given how much I've learned from him. So I wouldn't want to like use what he's taught me against him. <laughs> that makes sense. Superpowers to come for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, and again, I, 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 the way I like to see these, these kind of, for lack of a better word, storylines is that these have applicability beyond your specific businesses because there are probably people who are owning clinics in the same town that 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 could observe the same the same lessons here so i i i know i don't want to hold you over the time that i've asked you guys to join me for here and we're getting close to it and i want to make sure that you guys have the opportunity to mention 
where people can find you and learn more. And I know, Steve, you want to talk about the Center for Behavior and Climate as well. So I don't want to let you forget that. So maybe you want to say a few words about that and then we can wrap up. How's that sound? Yeah. Yeah. The Center for Behavior and Climate, well, you know, you had mentioned cottage industries, not not so much a, an industry, but sort of, well, another area of emphasis. We, we st- started a division of our company called the Center for Behavior and Climate three years ago. I hired a full-time environmental specialist, and she is, she's, has, has been and continues to develop courses on, on climate and mostly behavior in climate, what people can do to affect climate change. So if for anybody who wants to go to that, it's climate.bds.com, or you could just Google Center for Behavior and Climate. And, and also, you know, it, it, it's a way of us taking our, our instructional technology that we've been using and developing and putting it, applying it to another area that is, you know, it's extremely important. This, this climate crisis, it is a crisis and, and it, it affects all of us. And it's, it's, it's long term too. So we, behavior analysis that our field really has to get into this space and start helping out who steve who's the target audience for that are you mark are you uh, aiming that towards behavior analysts or is this just broad, broad education well, for the public or or well, you know who's your ideal customer or or student of of, of these of these curricula yeah it, it's it's both right now but but my i guess my big hope is that is that behavior analysis, behavior analysts will latch on to this passionately, this issue passionately, and start working in this area. I mean, I would be thrilled to death if we had, I mean, yes, we do need autism practitioners, but how many people with autism aren't affected by climate change? None of them. And we know how much, you know, climate change brings on all these, these weather emergencies, and we know how much our our clients with autism love change and <laughs> love to see their house get blown blown away and and or flooded or whatever so sure. so it affects everybody it and it affects the poor people and the disabled people people with disabilities probably more than than anybody so so that's something that I feel very right. passionate all right, and that's climate.bds.com. We'll have that link in the show notes. So that's that's awesome of you and your team to put that together. And Donna, do you want to mention the other podcast? Or Yeah, but it's your podcast. BDS has a podcast, and Steve and I talk a lot about exam prep on there and about our relationship. And we've got some other cool stuff in the pipeline that we're, we're working together. We've been talking for years about doing things, and now we're, we meet once a week and talk exam prep. Um, you can find me either at Donna Meller at all of the at all the social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, great place to talk with me. Um, and then of course, pass the big ABA exam dot com is our website and info at pass the big ABA exam. Info at pass the big ABA exam dot com is a great place to reach out if you have any information, if you need any information about our exam prep or just need to talk to somebody about, you know, how to move forward. You don't have to buy anything to call and reach out. We're there to support all people, just not Absolutely. the climate. That's for Steve. What climate change, Steve? Just kidding. <laughs> Very good. This has been a, a really fun conversation. Before I let you guys go, is there anything else about exam prep? Any last, last minute advice for someone in preparation that we, yeah, I know you guys have been dispensing great advice throughout this conversation. So no pressure to come up with something else just because it's the, you know, but I just want to give you the, the final word if you had any. If not, we'll we'll put a wrap on this and and go from there. Yeah, I, I, let me just give my email address. It's really easy. It's steve at bds.com if anybody wants to get in touch with me directly. Awesome. Everybody where to find BDS. The biggest thing for me, and I think we sort of did talk about it as far as exam prep is, you know, as much as I really do support people looking for, you know, simplified, layman, relatable ways of understanding the content, the exam is not that. And so make sure that you really can disseminate and understand this content 
in those textbook ways and 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 speak that jargony language in order to apply what you know to the exam. Great. All right, folks, this has been a really fun conversation. Thanks so much for joining me. Hey, thanks for checking out this episode. I know this is the non-standard outro, but I want to just uh, thank you for listening all the way through. I also want to draw your attention to the bds.com website. I mentioned this in the show notes, and it occurred to me that I forgot to mention this at the outset of the episode, but BDS has their own podcast. Yes, that's true. So if you go to the show notes for this episode, you can find a link to their podcast there, and this episode will be simultaneously broadcast over on their feed. So go over there and check it out, and uh, go more generally visit both BDS and Pass the Big AB Exams websites. Hit their contact page. If you enjoyed this content, just say hello to them. Uh, It was really great for them to carve out an afternoon to come join me on the Behavioral Observations podcast. And it's great that you join me as well, as well as Donna and Steve. So thanks a lot, and we'll see you in the next session of the Behavioral Observations podcast. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.